good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depend wherever you are. Today, I would like to discuss about energy absorbing reinforcement selection for deep underground mine. And I am Mustafa Sharif Sadeh from Western Australian School of Mine, WASM, and Curtin University, Australia. In this presentation, I will give you an introduction about deep underground mining and also I will discuss about the calculation of the ground demand or determination of the ground demand and also determination of the dynamic capacity of the ground support system and then we will discuss about that how we can select the reinforcement for deep underground condition with the seismic potential and also finally we will give a conclusion and as you can see in this slide, the mining statues in the old field Western Australia is given here. And as you can see, we have about 700 mine in the gold field and more than 50 years of the resource. And about 50% of this resource is iron ore and 8% gold, 7% alumina and 4% nickel and 30% petroleum. Uh, in the figure, you can see the distribution of the mining in goldfield area. In deep underground mining, we are facing several challenges. And as you can see in the top left figure, the challenges on the underground metal mining with the seismicity and stability. As you can see here, with the increasing of the depths, there are an increase of the in situ stress and disturbance of the active principal stresses and induced stress by neighbor excavation and stopping and also induced stress by natural seismicity or artificial seismicity and also stresses by groundwater and temperature and so on. And as you can see in the figure below, we can see the seismic activity of 1.7 near to the access drive and an ore drive. And on the right figure, you can see the failure of the material, violent failure of the material, which is ejected far from the wall. And in this figure, similarly, you can see on the left, you can see the ore body and major faults in the Canona Bell mine. And the right figure, you can see the recorded seismicity at the depths of about 1,000 meters. And as you can see in this figure shows that the, with the increasing of the depths, the possibility of the seismicity increases too. And if we simplify that, we have an underground excavation in the rock mass and the rock bolts are supporting the blocks when seismicity comes these blocks tend to eject and then the role of the rock bolt and support system is to keep that blocks stable and in the right figure it is schematically the block and then the seismic load and the forces applied on the block and rock bolt is shown and to manage the excavation failure risk we should be careful in the preliminary stages of the design. As you can see here, in the strategic design, when we are preliminarily designing the mine based on the collected data, based on the site investigation, we should try to put the location of the portal and excavations in the right location and right orientation and right shape and size. And this is the preliminary design. And when it goes to the early stages of mining, depend on the feedback from ground when you excavated the started excavation of the underground excavations, then based on the feedback from ground response during the early stages of the mining construction, you can revise your decision and by the secondary design such as excavation orientation and excavation shape size sequences of the excavation and also excavation method and excavation rate to reduce the risk or remove the risk and if some risk left then during the operation by managing the remain failure risk by support installation and also 
bug response, monitoring, and engineering judgment. And also, we can update the design to ensure the safety of the working environment. Overall, we can say that our interest is to remove or reduce the risk of the failure without installing support system at the early stages. But final stages, if some risk left, then the support system is the last option to install. And to design the support system in seismically active mines, we need to define the ground demand and also support capacity. As you can see here, three methods for the ground demand and also four methods to determine the support capacity that we will discuss in the coming slides. For this purpose, as you can see here, we have collected the main factors in reinforcement system performance, as you can see here, uh, such as loading condition and then interfaces such as resin, cement growth and so on, and also the reinforcement specification, material of the reinforcement and so on, and also the ground condition. To discuss about the first item in the previous slide about the ground demand, as you can see here, we have three methods to define the ground demand using the intact rock properties and estimation of failure thickness and ejection velocity and also rock burst damage potential method. And in the figures, you can see that the ejection from the both sides of the tunnel walls and also from the face of the tunnel. And we categorize the major failure mechanisms in underground excavation using under the seismic load. As you can see, if the ground is a thick layer rock, as it's shown in the figure A, with the seismicity, most likely rock bursts will happen, spalling and rock bursts. If the layers are vertical and thick, then the spalling will happen as shown in B. And if the layers is less thick or thin, then the buckling most likely happen is the most potential case. And then with the rock ejection caused by the seismic event, you can see in the figure C that the excavation in the rock mass, that seismicity caused the block ejection, which is the most general case. And instability in blocks, instability in back or in the roof due to the loosening triggered by the seismicity, you can see in the figure D. And also this figure categorized the sudden failure mechanisms, both categorized by the Kaiser and Kai, which is mostly rock buckling and rock fall and also the rock ejection and also categorized by Fong and Hudson for different categories such as strain burst, structure rock burst, and then unloading, spalling, arch collapse, and also the rock fall, and also rock sliding, and collapse at the fractured zones. And as you can see here, for the rock burst calculation based on the intact rock properties, so far four methods is developed, and then the graphs for the based on the energy stored in the rock and energy released from the rock. And based on those methods, four methods, we can calculate the index to show the severity of the rock burst. As you can see, low, strong, and violent condition based on the numbers that we are calculating from those factors. And practically, we use these factors for the Jinping 2 project. And as you can see, that different geotechnical zones, T1, T2Z, T3, T4, and so on. And also the depths of the tunnel at each geotechnical zone, and also the distance from the entrance, and also failure mode, and also the potential of the rock burst, and also potential of the squeezing. As you can see, in some area, there are no potential for rock burst some area very violent potential for rock burst and so on. And also in a mine in a Western Australia, you can see that the, we are visiting a mine with the rock burst just happened recently in August 2018. And you can see that the, in the figure A on the left wall, the rock burst and then ejection of the material until the left wall thrown from the right wall to left wall and you can see that how sharp is the material in figure b and also the undulation on the surface due to the movement and 
interesting part as you can see in the figure e you can see that how the rock bolt is failed and then the block is ejected far from the wall to define or determine the dynamic capacity of the ground support system also as you can see here this graph shows the load displacement for the different types of the rock bolt as you can see, split set and ductile rock bolt can sustain the long displacement, such as 14 cm, but the bearing capacity is low, about 5 ton or 50 kN. And on the other side, you can see the rebar with the, let's say, fully grouted rebar. However, the loading capacity is high, about 20 ton, but the displacement can stand only 4 cm of displacement. But our ideal rack bolt is like this. It means that could be able to be strong and then also large deformation to be able to accommodate the seismic load and deformation due to the seismic load. For this purpose, we have collected all types of the rock bolts for the energy absorbing purpose from 1987 to 2013. And we collected their specifications such as in a static and dynamic condition, load capacity, and also displacement capacity. As you can see here, for example, cone bolt is the load capacity of the 21 ton and deformation capacity of 118 millimeter. And for example, T bolt is the load capacity of the 27.6 ton and deformation capacity of 21 centimeter. And similarly, other rock bolts that you can check yourself. And also we investigated on the energy absorbing rock bolt failure mechanisms or reaction mechanisms. As you can see here, classified them to mode 1 shank stretching such as D-bolt, MP1, PAR1 and then BHRB series. As you can see, this style of the rock bolt and also mode 2 ploughing and mode 2 slippage. And you can see the cone bolt and then MC bolt, door bar bolt, and the guard fold, and so you can see the shape of the bolts also. And for shank stretching rack bolts, we collected the graphs. You can see that as we discussed, area under each graph shows the energy absorption, and also energy absorption rate is written on the graph also. For example, let's say BHRB 600 static rack bolt energy capacity is 70 kJ. And then let's say NCM per one volt is 45 kilojoule and so on. For example, expansion shell is only 3 kilojoule. And also for slippage, as you can see here, Garford, for example, 50 kilojoule and also Herbold, 145 kilojoule and also Conbold, 60 kilojoule and so on. And also as a summary of those slides is that, as you can see here, ultimate deformation and also energy absorption. Based on this one, we have an idea about that how much energy each type of the rock bolt can absorb based on the dynamic testing and also how much deformation they can accommodate. As you can see here, based on our test result, we investigated on the impact load deformation capacity and then cumulative deformation, cumulative energy absorption, and so on. And as you can see here, for a specific rock bolt such as MP1 from the new concept mining company rock bolts, you can see we tested the five group of rock bolts with five different impact loads and then with several times of the drop test. As you can see here, for example, G8 impact energy is 8 kJ and then drop weight is 551 kg. Impact momentum is 3000 kN per second and number of drops is 8 to 10. But if we go to the group 47, the impact energy is 46.7 and then drop weight is 3171 and impact momentum is 17000 kN per second and in one impact, one drop, the rock bolt is failed. As you can see here, detailed investigation on the rock bolt understanding the detailed behavior of rock bolt. For example, we categorize the load displacement graph to the mobilization stage and also plastic stage and plastic flow or ductile stage and also the ductile missing stage and also strain hardening stage and also the rebound stage.
And we can see in this graph and this graph. And then for different group of rock bolts. And also we summarized all this result, as you can see here, based on the duration of the individual stages. As you can see here, how long each stage takes. In this graph, most stages is the plastic flow stage, takes long time. And after the plastic flow stage, maybe strain hardening and rebound is the highest. And also based on the elongation at each stage, as you can see here, most elongation happens again in the plastic flow and after that in the strain hardening part. This is also a very interesting test result that shows the amount of energy stored in the rock bolt at each drop. As you can see here in the left figure shows the different drops, several drops on the G8 rock bolt. And as you can see here at each stage, there are energy stored in the rock bolt. It means that after several stages of the energy storage in rock bolt, rock bolt will fail even without not so high loading. And in the right view, you can see the 17 kilojoule energy with the three drop. And in the left, you can see the 8 kilojoule impact energy with the eight drops. And also this figure shows that in the left figure, that before the test, the rock bolt in the encapsulated pipe or in the concrete or resin. And on the right one, after the test, you can see that the deformation of the rock bolt after the test and how its diameter is reduced. And this slide, based on the old test result, as you can see here on the MP1, showed the momentum input and also impact duration. Based on the impact duration and momentum input, we categorize to the failure zone if the momentum input and impact duration is false in the yellow area, the rock bolt will fail. If it falls to the green area, then it will be stable. And in this slide, the experimental test results also shows for different encapsulation lengths. As you can see here, encapsulation lengths 1 meter, encapsulation lengths 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter goes until 40 centimeter. And then you can see that with increasing the encapsulation lengths, how rock bolt behavior will change. This graph also shows that we developed the rock bolt with three lengths at the middle and then encapsulation lengths at the end and also in the collar. And it means that this one also, when seismic loads come, these three lengths have potential to show the ductile behavior and absorb the energy, as you can see here. And this is the load distribution along the rock bolt, as you can see here which damp a lot of seismic load using this system. And also, this is the monitoring of the deformation along the rock bolt to see that how this rock bolt will behave and how long deformation will be able to accommodate. And then, as you can see, for a test results is applied to a specific underground hydropower cavern. And as you can see in the graphs, Different dates, you can see the displacement of the collar of the rock bolt and end of the rock bolt at different distances from the rock bolt. Based on the ground demand that we determined and the dynamic capacity that we collected, then we are going to see that how we can select the reinforcement. As you can see in this slide, we categorized, implemented all energy absorbing rock bolt in this graph. And based on this energy absorbing condition, we divided the deformation also to 5 cm, 10 cm, 20 cm, 30 cm, and more. And then rock balls that can tolerate 5 cm of the displacement, we call them stiff rock ball, which is most suitable for static condition. It means that non seismic condition. And rock balls can accommodate the deformation until 10 cm. Then we call them the medium yielding rock bolt. And then the rock bolt that can accommodate until 20 centimeter, we call them the yielding rock bolt. And until the 30 centimeter, very high yielding rock bolt. And then until the 40 centimeter, extremely high yielding rock bolt. And also in this graph, you can see that the type of the rock bolt and also amount of energy absorption is written on the graph. As you can see here, for example, 
Cobalt 38 kilojoule and then Garford 50 kilojoule or Cobalt 60 kilojoule or MP1 bolt 52.6 kilojoule. And this graph is also the recommendation of the rock bolt based on the ground demand and then support capacity. As you can see here, First category is that if the ground demand is less than 50 mm in the surface displacement and also less than 5 kJ of the energy per square meter, then this category could be called low or stiff. And also the recommended reinforcement is expansion shell, rock ball, resin cement, steel rebar, and so on. And if the surface displacement is 5 to 10 centimeter and energy absorption 5 to 15 kilojoule per square meter, then it is a medium category. And then type of the rock bolt is split set, soil X, roof X, yield lock, modified rebar. And if it's 100 to 200 millimeter and 15 to 25 kilojoule, then soil X, D bolt, and cobalt, roof X, yield lock, Parvon, Vulcan will be suitable for this growth and then it is high energy absorbing category and if it's 200 to 300 then 25 to 35 kilojoule per square meter and roof X, Cobalt, Garford, Vulcan is recommended which is a very high category and if it's more than 300 millimeter displacement then energy absorbing with the energy of more than 35 kilojoule per meter square then Cobalt and Garfor, which is extremely high, is recommended. And this is the same graph as previous slide, but is another view, as you can see, maybe to facilitate the application in practice. Also, the, another view with the deformation at failure and also the reaction pressure, how much pressure they can accommodate. And this is a case study that we discussed before also in an underground mine, deep underground metal mine that you can see the stops at each level and sequencing of the stops and also the seismicity. And as we discussed in other slide, similar the failure mode and so on in this mine at the level of the 7075N. And as you can see here for this case, as you can see from the side view, the location of the ramp and then ramp or decline and also the location where seismic happened. And based on this one, as you can see here, ground demand input is considered as a magnitude of 2.6 and then design distance is 10 meter and PPV is 8 meter per second and then site amplification factor 3 and ejection velocity is 2.4 and then support capacity inputs is 2.4 kinlock which can absorb 15 kilojoule split set can absorb 8 kilojoule 2.4 meter car for dynamic ball can absorb 25 kilojoule and then 6.5 meter car for dynamic cable can absorb 25 kilojoule and FRS 4 kilojoule and mesh 3 kilojoule. We use the chain link mesh or the woven mesh to better absorb the energy. And as you can see here, this is the pattern of the support system. As you can see, the Garford cable bolt and also the Garford dynamic bolt pattern. And also you can see the pattern of the rack bolt and cable bolt. And it's mostly cable bolts as they partially bounded, as you can see in this slide. And also Garford is like this. And this is the woven mesh or chain link mesh. And this is the installation method of that. As you can see in this mine, and also the partial encapsulation mechanism, as you can see here, and the area which is supported. And as a conclusion, also at the end, we developed the ground support system design. As you can see in the left side, if it's static condition, what procedure we should take? And if it's in dynamic condition, whether based on the strain burst or buckling or ground motion, shake down or ejection what type of the actions we can take and also for each type for example for static we also determine that let's say based on the origin of the loading based on the geological structure or rock mass condition and load factor 
what type of potential failure could happen at the beginning and in the long term and also what is the appropriate analysis method and what is the suggested support system and you can read in this in detail whether from the slide or from the reference that i have given to you and similarly for dynamic condition or origin of the loading whether the seismic event strain burst and so on for geological structure and load factor and then potential failure in short term and long term appropriate design analysis which is mostly based on the energy based method and also the suggested ground support system and finally i would like to acknowledge the universities and companies that helped us Tonji University, Northeastern University, Mining Education Australia, and New Concept Mining, and Rock Technology or Rock Support Technology, and also Evolution Mining. Thank you very much and have a nice time.